Sound free. Sound free. Going on that um, the Anarchy tour, the atmosphere. The Anarchy tour was total fun. Everything about it was a gas. It was great. Now, at a, what? Oh, oh, let me just show you something. I, I just got a, I got it the other day. Wait, uh, Phil. You know, you know the poster where Hendrick is on one side, and the Anarchy tour is on the other side. Look in there, Theo. Right. I want to show you something. Out of all these gigs. Uh, I think they got them written down. Some friend of mine gave me a po oh, it's a weird poster because one side is uh, a Jimi Hendrix poster and the other side is Anarchy to the Anarchy Tour poster, which uh, how the hell are you going to hang it up? You know, you need two. So dig this. Here you go with the An Sex was Anarchy Tour poster with uh, John Tunners and the Heartbreakers. Now, out of all those dates, how many dates would you say are there? Look. A quick guess. I don't know, 40, 38, 40, 30 some odd. We only did, we, I think we only did five or six dates. And we're lucky we got them. I mean, every time we went into an area, Leeds, you name it, whatever we went into, we had little babies, little people, little girls and boys who know nothing whatsoever about musical politics with their mothers and their fathers and their picketing and then going apeshit over the fact that we, these bad boys, are doing a gig in their town. And they made a mess of everything. Okay, so I guess we didn't do too many gigs, but we made up for it. We had a blast. We did gigs on the bus. We took all our friends with us to tour on the tour because we purposely, uh, there was, our, our, you know, all those punk rock kids, some of them were 12 years old, and they were so wild <laughs> and so inventive and so creative for youngsters. They could, to, I wouldn't be surprised if today they are really in the mainstream of fashion, fashion in, in, institute, industries. Um, I mean, they're creative in their look. Yes, yes, very original too, extremely original. Now, I've noticed through uh, watching these kids at the tours and stuff, I noticed that they had obviously looked at pictures of New Yorkers and stuff, because they, they did cop the same drag we had a few years earlier. Uh, so what, you know? And what about Johnny Rotten? What was he like on stage? Johnny Rotten was a natural. Johnny Rotten was a very good performer and he was a very good singer. The thing was, at first, I don't think he knew it. I don't think he believed it. And I think he was just going to make the best of it by um, letting it come and letting it go. So but I, casual. Yeah. But I think in time, he started to realize he just wasn't something to pass by. I think he realized that he was, he was actually good. He could sing. He could perform. He, he was very creative. Uh, clothes wise I think without recognizing it there's a thing Gene, uh, there's a thing uh, Jimmy Hendrix used to say music and show business go hand in hand and Johnny Rotten had that whether he would admit it or not or whether he even knew it I don't know but he had it he would do these th I remember one thing that just sticks out in my mind and I don't know why the band's playing and I don't know, the crowd's maybe a little off key and uh, in the audience off key. And uh, I don't know if it's almost getting rowdy, but something's happening. And I don't quite know what yet because I'm way in the back and, or I'm in the dressing room, I'm looking over the, the banister and some scene is being created and I don't hear no music. So what I'm seeing is Johnny, his, he had beautiful baggy, real baggy pants and he had those what do you call those shoes, those boat, you know, those big fat thick shoes, you know. But he wore them well, and he was dressed very well. Great, really outrageous jacket, short cut, one button, velvet cut, black velvet collar. Uh, the suit had like little designs in, in the in the pattern, and he 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 just looked great. He he was good looking. 
He walked, he handled himself great. He was extremely handsome. Um, he was sexy, even sexy, which I, it didn't come to my attention until a girl mentioned it to me. And uh, she was right. Well, he, he goes into his pocket and he just, I think somebody was giving him a hard time in the audience. So he goes into his pocket very slowly at his own pace and he pulls out some change. He's like counting his change, like make sure he has enough for bus fare to get on the bus and go home. You know, that's, that's what it looked like to me. And it's the way he did it with such humor and camp, tongue in cheek, and I like that. Uh, he, he was a perfect model for the dolls. He, he could have been in the dolls easily. If times were right, if either one of us were English or American, blah, 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 he would have been a perfect doll or maybe even vice versa. But what about the drugs at the time? What was the... Um, Br drugs? Because <laughs> what was the, the English kids were over What was their attitude to drugs? Experimental. They hadn't... Well, uh, just like I think with everybody, I don't think people just have enough information, enough at their disposal, knowledge about drugs and all different types of drugs, which is a shame and a goddamn pity because it's hurting many, many people. Why was, because um, you knew Sid Vicious, didn't you? I knew Sid very well. What was well. he like? Sid was very, very quiet. Sid was soft, but not in a not in a uh, unmasculine way. He was, it wasn't in his nature to hurt people or to be mean. What happened was, and what, and what Johnny and I discussed about Sid after his death, Johnny, not Thunders, Johnny Lydon, we listened to one of his, his records. We were up in Max's, Kansas City, and we heard some of the words in the song and we knew what it applied to right away. And uh, I told Johnny, well, Johnny, we all make our own Frankensteins. And there's yours. You made your own Frankenstein. It interrupted with you what you wanted to do. It, it cramped your style. It took away from, you, from what you wanted in the music business and in uh, showmanship and awareness and being a star. It got in your way. He, he was your friend, yeah, and you wanted him more than Glenn Matlock, maybe, yeah, but there was no room for Sid Vicious in the Pistols. It took the balance away, and took it away from Johnny. Well, you're a gentleman, why do you think there is so much self-destructiveness in rock and roll? I'm not too sure there is any more or less than anything else. I just think it's in the public's eye that much more. It's showbiz. It's very old-fashioned. There's nothing new about this. This is, I mean, it's so old and it's been around for so long. It's just simple showbiz. But was it also that thing about, you know, live fast, die young? Nah, well? Bullshit. Nobody wants to die. Nobody wants to die young either. Unless you have a, a personal very, very personal reason where you have given up. I don't even know if that's if it's right for me to say given up, because I'm not too sure I buy this escape bit. I think if a person doesn't want to live anymore, that's it. Nothing you can do, say, is going to stop that. Now, I think there's a period where you can, the person that might be on this suicidal trip. I think there's a period where he will finally have the opportunity to face facts, whether to go or not. But you can't stop anyone from killing themselves. And the spirit with which you were all doing drugs, was that in a spirit of like experiment or fun? At first, to a degree. But look, I think everybody has their own specific reason in the beginning to take drugs, especially when you start to take them constantly and start to depend on them. 
which brings in uh, self-doubt, which brings in uh, not wanting to admit it to yourself. You could be a junkie, you could be addicted, you could have a disease for many, many years before you face just the simple fact of telling yourself you're strung out.